In this episode of Influencers, Feld Entertainment Chairman and CEO, Kenneth Feld. People want entertainment and they want affordable entertainment and we can bring it to them. The one hit wonders, you have as much effort and energy into something that is a one shot. If you can build something for a lifetime, uh, you've really got something. I think what it is, it's people watching other people that they can relate to as humans, but then when they see what these people do, these amazing things, they go, wow, how would I be able to do that? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Kenneth Feld, CEO of Feld Entertainment. Kenneth, nice to see you. Thank you. Great to see you, Andy. So I want to talk to you about all your properties and all the different kinds of businesses and shows that you put on, but we really have to start with the iconic Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus. And you're bringing this back next year, but it's a little bit different from what people may know historically. Talk to us about that, Kenneth. Yeah. Uh, Ringling Brothers Barnum Bailey is the ultimate uh, family entertainment icon across America. So we're 151 years old. We're bringing it back in the fall of 2023. And it will be uh, a completely redesigned show. Um, a lot of the things, when we closed in 2017, we were working with a uh, really 146 year old business model. And uh, we had a two mile long trains, we had school, we had restaurants, all these things. And we decided that we wanted to streamline it and take all of those types of, uh, where we were spending a lot of money that the consumer never saw uh, to function and rethink it, modernize it, and come back with the new Ringling, the greatest show on earth for today and tomorrow's kids, parents, and grandparents. Right, now there, there are no elephants, there's no animals in the show, that's one big difference. And how will you be able to make the show as captivating as it was before without uh, the critters? The, th the thing about Ringling has always been about the people. And I, I started in, uh, really it was 1969 uh, and I was going all over the world looking for talent. And what impressed me more than anything were circus people and their stories. And they're uh, incredible because they're people that are like all of us, but they rehearse, they have a discipline and they create these incredible feats where many times they're risking their lives, where there's a high wire flying trapeze or different skills to, per, to perfection. But it's something, they all have other talents. It's not just the one thing, even though they dedicate their lives to entertaining people in a way that is um, pretty unique, uh, but it is global. So we're gonna tell their stories while you're there. So there'll be a real emotional connection that families will have with the performers and then everybody will get to know them uh, in an incredible way, the way I've gotten to know them over a half a century. Right, so, um, and there was criticism by uh, animals rights activists, I guess, that sort of led to your decision not to have animals there, number one. And number two, is it gonna be a little bit like the Cirque du Soleil, I mean, you're going to have the traditional clowns and trapeze artists, but is it going to be a little bit more like that? Those two points, please. It's, it's really going to be something that we're reimagining and we are focusing on families and we're focusing on connections between the performers and the audience. And if you think about it, by the time we go out, it'll be six and a half, seven years of not seeing Ringling. So it's a whole new generation of kids, a new generation of parents, and actually a new generation of grandparents that can go together to have a great experience. And it'll be a show, a production that will be mind blowing. And it will have all the tenets that we've always had 
which are the humor, the whimsy, the wow factor, the thrill factor. And it'll be something that is relatable to everybody. And, you know, if you think about it, humor is quite different today. So the humor, what kids laugh at today is quite different than what they laughed at probably 40 years ago. And so everything will be updated uh, and the presentation of it will bring you into the fold and you'll be able to get a, an emotional connection with the performers as you follow them through the show. And it'll be a give and take between the audience and the performers. And I think it'll be a really unique way to experience a brand new type of family entertainment. And why did it take so long? I mean, I'm sure the pandemic uh, had something to do with that, but you were closed down, uh, wanted to revamp things even before that. That's true. And actually we were planning to come back in 2021 when the pandemic hit in uh, 2020, March of 2020. Unfortunately, being in the live entertainment business, we were completely shut down and we had tours literally all over the world. So we thought we'd take the extra time in rethinking everything about our company, actually. And if you think about it, um, and what we talked about with the senior team was, we're basically a 150 year old startup. And we can make it anything that we didn't have the time for because we're so involved in the operations. And so we did that. And it was um, uh, really something Rarely in, a, in, the, in business do you get an opportunity to do that. So we took a deep, hard look at all of our businesses and came back, I think, stronger than ever. Uh, we were the first live touring entertainment in the world to go out um, at the end of uh, 2020, in November of 2020. And that was first initially with Disney on Ice and with our Monster Jam productions. But in addition to that, we were the first sport, because we have Monster Energy Supercross, the first sport in, in the pandemic to finish and complete the season. And we did the last seven races uh, in Salt Lake City with no live audience, but with the television audience. But we learned a lot from all of these different things early on so that um, we figured out how we could revamp uh, in this new world that we're living in, and especially with touring entertainment. Yeah, you talked about some of your other properties and businesses, and we do want to get into that. But I think that's really interesting when you're talking about the learnings uh, that you guys were able to glean from conversations, I'm sure, with health experts, but also with executives who run the different venues. Talk about what those conversations were like, Kenneth, and, and where do you think things stand today with regard to getting back to live events in this country? Well, I know from, from at least from the Feld Entertainment side, uh, we've seen incredible pent up demand. Uh, and it's been extraordinary. And not just because we go and we put on shows, but I would go there and the energy from the audience was almost like a relief. They've been waiting two years to come to see something where they could come as families, share the experience. And I think the level of audience appreciation is greater than anything I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, so I, I wanna ask you, I mean, everyone's gotten so um, wedded to our devices, to digital communication, to digital entertainment. Is there really a future for live events and for live entertainment? Absolutely, more than ever. and. I think we all realized this during the pandemic and we were doing the this Zoom calls and all the remote calls and everything else. And it's all two dimensional. No matter how great it is, it's two dimensional. What we provide is a three dimensional experience. And I, I was more positive than I'd ever been to know when we came back. And it's one of the reasons we wanted to be one of the first live entertainment entities to return because the pent up demand. People missed it. We realized how we missed the actual socialization of what it is to go out and share these live experiences in real time. And there's always been an emotional level 
that the um, audience gets from live entertainment that you don't get uh, on a screen or remotely. And I think that was missed maybe as much as anything else, even if we didn't recognize it at the time. We're seeing the results of that, uh, not only in business, but in the way people feel about it. And we get so many uh, comments and we get emails and people go on our website and they just go, thank you for reopening, for coming back so we could share something with our family. And I think that's what we're about. It's all family entertainment. And that's everything that we do. Uh, and I think it's something that is never going away. We're always going to be people. And yes, there will be the metaverse. There will be all of these other things. But there will never be a real substitute for live entertainment. One thing you guys seem to be pretty good at is partnering with other organizations. You just mentioned a couple of them. I mean, the Disney on Ice, so you work with the Walt Disney Company, obviously. Uh, Marvel, you work with, you work with Sesame Street. How do you engender those kinds of relationships from a business standpoint, Kenneth? Our, our whole philosophy and being a privately owned family business, I think maybe is a little help because we look at everything with the long-term view. Our Disney relationship with Disney on Ice started 41 years ago. And uh, we've played to, over that time, probably pretty close to 400 million people around the world. And we operate in 75 countries. So it's been an incredible uh relationship with the Disney company. And it's really because we love what we do. We treat their intellectual property like it's theirs. We care about it. We have the respect for it. And I think that's been one of the keys to our success is the respect for other people's IP in the same way that we have respect for ours, whether it's Ringling or Monster Jam or Supercross, which things that we actually own. And so it's been good. It's non-conflictive. And uh, it allows us to do things in different ways, because especially today, I and mean, you've got the prices of gasoline, uh, we bring the entertainment <clears throat> to your backyard, basically. We're playing all the stadiums, all the arenas, all over the world. And so it is a way to get uh, a localized feeling for whether it's the Disney company, whether it's Monster Jam, whatever it may be. Uh, and I think that's important because we bring it to, to the people. And I think that's a big differentiator uh, with our company because we focus on the live entertainment and we take it all over the world, wherever it may be. You know, I'm thinking about Disney on ice and the length of that relationship it is one very specific type of entertainment, which is the skating. Have you ever talked to them about what if the Disney characters played basketball? <laughs> what if they played volleyball? What if you have, I mean, just there's all kinds of things you could do with them, right? There is, and there has been over the years, and we continue to, and our shows are Disney on ice, but they have a lot of aerial work in them. And, you know, if you think about it, look back, our foundation, is Ringling, is the greatest show on earth. And there's a saying at Ringling Brothers Barn and Bailey, nothing is impossible. And when you see what the people do, and so we've brought that, that feeling of entertainment into everything that we do. So they may ice skate, but they may be aerialists as well. And that's always been uh, the way we've operated. And the same thing, uh, We've done that and brought it to all different types of IP that we have or, or that we um, have through other companies. And how did you get into monster trucks? I mean, obviously, it's the, the big, the venues there is the common denominator. But tell us that story. Uh, in 2008, I had, I had seen Monster Jam before, and uh, it was a great idea, and it was a good show. And um, it was owned by Live Nation. So found out they wanted to sell it and wound up by uh, getting involved in the, uh, the business side of that in a, in a bid. And we acquired uh, Monster Jam uh, Supercross uh, in 2008. 
ironically, about a week before that recession started. And um, we've built it over the years, and we now um, operate globally with Monster Jam. Supercross has grown, <clears throat> and we've continued to grow these uh, valuable franchises. And that's what we like to do, because my theory is the one-hit wonders, you have as much effort and energy into something that is a one-shot. If you can build something for a lifetime, uh, you've really got something, and it's a legacy, and it's something that people look forward to every year. But the great thing is we've been able to constantly improve what we've done because we're sort of relentless in that. And we, our whole focus is on the consumer. What we want to do is make families that come to our shows happy. We want to create a conversation in the car ride home so that they have something to talk about. They, they may like different things in any of the shows, but it, they each have a, a point of view. And I think it's um, something great. And I think in many ways, uh, this kind of family entertainment is lacking around the world. Speaking of the consumer, I want to ask you some questions about the economy, Kenneth, because we're starting to see some strains there. Obviously, there's inflation, there's talk about recession, um, and you have to price those tickets. I'm wondering if you've had to change your business model or your thinking this year in terms of inflation or consumer fears about a slowing economy. Well, we definitely have. And I mean, I think for us, the transportation side, the supply chain is, has been issues. And as we go internationally, we have half a dozen tours out now outside the US. Um, it, it's very challenging. But the one thing that we've always done is we, we are priced for families and we, we don't wanna change that. Uh, so what do we do? Hopefully we'll get more volume. And I think in times like this, and you know, I've been with the business over 50 years, been through a lot of economic cycles and seen gas prices. And I remember 1982 and all of this, but people want entertainment and they want affordable entertainment and we can bring it to them and if they, they may forego some long trip or someplace else, and they'll be at home. But this is something that we bring to them. It's affordable and it's a real value. And we're committed to keeping uh, our pricing affordable. Another facet of the economy, Kenneth, of course, is labor and finding employees and compensating them. How are you finding that environment right now? Are you having a tough time trying to hire people and retain them? I think it's, I, I see a big difference in all of our businesses. So for instance, if you're a professional ice skater, we're the largest employer of professional ice skaters in the world. So we have a place where you can work and uh, these people wanna do that and they wanna tour. I think in the technical positions, it is more difficult. But what we've tried to do and hopefully been successful over the years is create a culture uh, within our company. Uh, and we have so many multi-generational uh, associates with us. And I knew a lot of them when they were kids and their parents worked for us. So I, I think we try and be a good place, a good workplace. I mean, I think that's the most important thing. And people want to come to work here. And it's something different. It's unique. And we're flexible because in today's world, you have to be flexible with everything we can. But the one thing, when we have shows, we have to have all the people show up. And um, it's always been that way. And these people are primarily giving up their weekends uh, because that's when most of our business is. Quick follow-up question there. How many ice skaters do you typically employ? Uh, we employ typically, and it, it varies throughout the year a little bit, but uh, with the eight shows, it's probably about 500 ice skaters. Wow, 500 <laughs> professional ice skaters. That's, that is a lot, right? It's a lot, yeah. I didn't yeah. know there were that many, but I guess hockey players are professional ice skaters in a way too, so there's a lot of them out there as well. They are. Yeah. Do you ever hire any former hockey players? I think we have had some. I don't remember 
off the top of my head, but we do. And they typically, you know, it's a different discipline for ice hockey and for uh, uh, figure skating. But we used to have, or we have people that do a lot of jumps and yeah. the jumpers typically wear uh, hockey skates so they can go faster and they get a little better lift on that. There you go. Um, so your business um, must have been pretty hard hit during the pandemic, um, getting back to that because things got shut down. How did you manage the company at that point? Um, did you have to lay people off? Did you have to cut salaries? What did you tell people? And, and how did you get through it? Well, it was the, the most difficult time in my business life, for sure. And we got hit almost all at once. Uh, and it was about March 12th. And we had 28 shows around the world and about 3,300 people on all these shows. <clears throat> and we had equipment and people in different parts of the world. And we had to get, first and foremost, we had to get the people back to their homes, which we did. And then the equipment, we had to figure out a way to get it back here for the most part, because we couldn't leave containers with a lot of electrical equipment, costumes and things like that on a pier for we didn't know how long it would be. Uh, so that was that was another challenge that we had. And it was devastating. And we did uh, lay off a lot of people and because we had no business at the time. So what we did is the senior team got together and we said, what can we do? How can we get back as soon as possible? What are the ways that we can get back? And how can we do it differently so that we come out of this as a better company? And I, I did ha always have a theory that when, when the COVID hit and we got shut down like everyone else really in the live entertainment business, anybody that was gonna come back, if they ca thought they were coming back the same way, they weren't gonna make it. And we really revamped everything. And we had been working on different kinds of technology in different areas of our business. And it was a time, let's do it. And we, we actually made some investments in technology to upgrade us. So when we came back, we could come back in a better, better space. And I think that was it. And it was grueling to come to work every day for that period of time, because I, you know, we have the people and they have families and every, there wasn't anyone that was exempt from the COVID, even if they didn't get COVID, it was what was happening. And it was really at that point, I had to be positive. And I, I always felt that we were gonna come back great and there was always gonna be a demand for what we're doing. It wasn't going away. We just didn't know when it would come back. And so that's really how it evolved. And I must say, we couldn't have done it without the team that we did and everybody really working together. So it's, it changed the culture a little bit and I would say in better ways for the company. And now we have a very bright future, bright outlook and business has been extraordinary over the past year. Perhaps you benefited uh, from the fact that you're a private company, as you said, Kenneth, and you're, you've got the third generation of the company founded by your father, Irvin. You joined the company, as you said. Uh, your daughters work there now in executive positions. What is it like uh, having a family-run enterprise at scale like this? And what are the upsides and maybe some downsides, too? I think, for me, it's the most gratifying thing because, uh, you know, I think um, when we had little kids, I now have seven grandchildren, but when my daughters were young, uh, they would spend so much time at the circus, at Disney on Ice, whatever it was. This is how they grew up. And it, it has something. It's almost like a, a magnetic pull uh, and a love that we have for everything that we do. And... I think I was gratified that they wanted to come into business and it's difficult and uh, I admire them for that and they've done extraordinary jobs and 
you know, I must say they bring a different point of view uh, to the business than I had. Uh, they're a different generation and it's the right thing for the long term for the company to have a lot of more youthful thought than what I have. I've been there. They can ask me about history, but um, they really helped take it to a very new place. Kenneth, what do you think it is about the circus that resonates so deeply with human beings? I mean, this goes back hundreds, maybe thousands of years, right? It does. And the other thing, they may call it something different in every country, but every country in the world has circus. They may call it acrobatics. They may call it something else. But it, it, when you get down to it, it's circus. I think what it is, it's people watching other people that they can relate to as humans. But then when they see what these people do, these amazing things, they go, wow, how would I be able to do that? And one of the things with Ringling, as we bring it back now, we're taking that. And instead of just coming to your city once a year, our goal is to be a 365 day attraction franchise if, for one of something better. Because first of all, there are all kinds of youth circuses around the country. We're gonna affiliate with a lot of them so that we can touch you on a regular basis. Because the more interest there is, and it's aspirational, uh, the more people are gonna wanna do it and stay involved. And it, it can hit you, the circus covers everything, and Ringling does. And whether it's from an art point of view, whether it's a physical point of view, uh, whether is it, it's humor, it's something that everyone can relate to on different levels. And each of those aspects is what we want to bring to you every single day of the year. You have a pretty big facility down there on the Gulf Coast of Florida near Sarasota and Naples. How big is it and what do you guys do there? So we have a 47 acre campus. Uh, we have the main building is 580,000 square feet. And we have, uh, to give you a point of reference, we have two rehearsal halls. Each have larger floor space than Madison Square Garden. We have more hanging capacity for equipment uh, in each of those uh, rehearsal spaces than any other venue in America. Uh, so we train everybody, we, re we rehearse here, but we more than that, we fabricate. We have a costume shop, we have over 12,000 costumes. Um, we, we have uh, dinosaurs that we've built for our Jurassic World live tour, which goes out in September. And uh, it's incredible. You go by and you think it's the real deal. We have Monster Jam, so we have the whole shop here. Uh, one of the aspects of Monster Jam is there's a lot of damage every week, I will tell you that. <laughs> and so we're fixing trucks constantly, but we're building them. And every single piece of that truck is fabricated here. The tires, we have a tire partner, BKT in India, and we've engineered monster truck tires with them to get the most and the best performance out of all the trucks. We have Monster Jam University, where we teach people uh, to become monster truck drivers for Monster Jam. And that's a rigorous schedule and We've been on a mission over the past several years to bringing in, before there was no way in. So now with the university, we can train everybody. We can train people that maybe were never in this business that wanted to be, that were thrilled as kids with Monster Jam. Uh, now they can become part of it. It never existed before. So we have women, we have uh, a great amount of diversity in all the drivers and they're great personalities because again, Everything we do, it's wonderful to see all the effects. It relates to people. It's the live people that come to see us, and it's the live people that perform these incredible feats. If you have any openings for monster truck drivers, let me know. I am I'm ready to sign up, okay? We have a simulator. You can come down here and try it out. 
All right, I'll see if I like it and then maybe I can apply. Final question. You have had an incredible career developing all these different properties and businesses. What are you most proud of, Kenneth? I think I'm most proud of when I go to one of the shows and I see the audience, everybody's happy. And I think that's something that um, more than anything should be the legacy of what we do is we're bringing families together for a happy experience. Doesn't happen a lot in today's world. Kenneth Feld, CEO of Feld Entertainment, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.